Good morning. Now you want to maybe want to check and turn it up on the side if you need to turn it up. I'm hoping you all can uh, hear me today. We're grateful to have this opportunity to be here on today. Uh, uh, we had a few technical difficulties with our instruments, but I think we pretty much got it together now. So uh, uh, thanking and praising God for this opportunity to be here on today. Honor and respect to Pastor Meredith, Dr. Felker, and Sister Shirley Felker. Hope they're doing well as well as to uh, uh, Chairman of our Trustee Absolutely. Ministry, um, uh, Sister Gloria Williams, and her family, Brother Eugene. We hope you guys are doing well. And uh, I'm hoping you all can hear me. Uh, if you can, if somebody just say yes uh, on the screen, I'd appreciate it, uh, because we're trying a different instrument here. We want to make sure we got it adjusted properly. Uh, also want to give honor and respect to uh, uh, chairman of our deacons, Deacon Milton Taylor, and Sister Repsy. Hope you all's families are doing well as well. And of course, to uh, all of the members of the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, and of course, uh, the family and friends of Mount Carmel. Pastors, brother pastors, we thank God for you sharing with us on today. Uh, and each and every one of you family members, my baby girl who shares with us on often occasions. Uh, hello to you. Uh, saw that the uh, Cardinals won. Uh, I think you all told everybody on the planet that the Cardinals won the other day. So I was one of them on the planet to get that information. So yes, the Cardinals did win. I'll write it in. Okay. And so we're going to get ready to uh, go into our Bible study on the day. Uh, we're going to start with our uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, uh, Psalm 51, uh, 1 through 13. And then we're going to uh, have our invocation of prayer. Psalm 51, beginning uh, at verse 1 in the King James Version, sounds like this. Have mercy upon me, O God according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightst be justified when thou speak and be clear when thou judge. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Psalm verse 51, verses 1 through 13, the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before, the health and strength that you've given us. We ask that you be with us now as we come together Invoke your blessing upon us as we share, as we learn, as we grow together in your word. Be with those who have logged on to be with us on today, O oh God. And then continue to be with those who had a desire to be with us and could not. Keep us now. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right. Again, we're thankful as we are now getting ready to start session 28 uh, of our study in Isaiah. Uh, today's section is part two from what we did on last week which was comfort in God's promises, comfort in God's promises. And during this particular session, we're going to be covering chapters 40 through 48. So we're really starting to move through this, 66 chapters, and so we're going to make it, but we're going to get ready to go through these areas of it. So now, just by way of bringing us up to speed to kind of settle us in as we get ready to go into this, we closed our last session with what I like to call some of the notable passages of Scripture that are covered in Isaiah chapter 40, also known as the chapter of comfort. You know, one of the things, one of the things that the book of Isaiah is big for as knowledge amongst the common readers of the Bible is some of these notable passages that are very quotable passages, very meaningful passages. Just about everybody has kind of heard them or they've known them at some point. There are many of them, <coughs> but on last session I pulled out a few of them and I'm just going to review us with them. It's important for us to understand that in chapter 40, what we have going on in chapter 40 is a message given to Isaiah by God to let his people know that his promises to them are still good, even though they, the people, 
have been wrong and they deserve the punishment that they're going to receive. The message is God still loves them and he will restore them. God keeps his promises. Amen. So now, the notable passages that we have, that I have for you today, that we shared on last week, and we're going to share again. <clears throat> I'm going to share them in the King James Version because many of us, we learned and we heard these passages of Scripture in the King James Version. The first one is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. It sounds like this. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now that's a passage of scripture that was referring to John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer as we uh, correctly know him and describe him as. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But then a second passage is Isaiah chapter 40, again, verses 4 and 5. Listen to this. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now that's a very, very moving passage for me, as I shared with you last time we were together. That's a passage that I remember hearing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quote in one of his speeches. It was very moving uh, when he used that passage of scripture, but that's one of those, again, one of those notable passages. But then there's a third one, and this from verse eight in Isaiah chapter 40. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Most of you may remember hearing that when we preachers, after we read our text uh, for that Sunday or uh, for that service, and then after we read that text, we will quote the words, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Very notable passage of scripture. And then there's a fourth notable passage that I shared on last session that I'm gonna share with you. And that's from verses 28 through 31. It's a little longer. Still coming out of chapter 40, the comfort chapter, verses 28 through 31. It sounds like this, beginning at verse 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Here comes the passage. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, those are some of the notable passages of Scripture that kind of draw, draw us, especially novices as it relates to studying the Word of God, kind of draw us to the Word of God, draw us to hear God speaking to us because those passages kind of jump out at us and we kind of get them, okay? So now, that's what comes out of the, uh, what's called the comfort chapter of, of chapter 40 of Isaiah. So now, moving to Isaiah chapter 41. We go into chapter 41 and we kind of see some, some something just a little bit different. So just listen to this. In this chapter, there are, three poems of comfort, okay? There's first, the first poem is a personal poem, and that's to his chosen servant Israel, also known as Jacob, okay? And that's verses eight through 13. We're gonna read those for you. But then there's a second poem, and it's more specific, and that's to the redeemed warrior tribe, or in other words, the entire family of Israel, okay? And that's verses 14 through 16. But then there's a third uh, poem, which is a general poem, and that's to the poor and the needy, uh, those who have had everything taken from them, and that's verses 17 through 20. Again, in, in Isaiah chapter 41, there are three poems of comfort that are, uh, the first poem is coming out of Isaiah uh, chapter 41, verses eight through 13. The second one is a more specific poem and it deals with verses 14 through 16. And then the third poem is a more general poem to the poor and the needy, uh, and that's verses 17 through 20. We'll take a look at these segments of passages, these poems, and then kind of share what they're saying to us on today. Poem number one, verses eight through 13. And again, we're gonna be using the New American Standard Bible, okay? But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, Descendant of Abraham, my friend, 
You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but you will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Amen. Word of God for the people of God. Now in this first poem here, in this segment here, what we have is very, a message that's very personal. And uh, this is personal as God is only speaking uh, to Jacob, who is also known as Israel himself. I mean, it, it comes out as a real personal poem. He's speaking uh, to Israel. He's speaking to Jacob himself. It's a personal reference. It becomes important. And one of the reasons why this becomes important is because God is showing the people that he remembers their beginnings as he prepares them for their future. He's going all the way back to a time before they were even a country, okay? When they were just a name, when it was just Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, and he hadn't even begun to have children yet that it would be the children of Israel. And so uh, he goes all the way back to that because where we're at now in the context of the scripture in and of itself is a time where the prophecy is letting them know that you're going to lose everything that God had promised you. And you're going to lose everything that God had promised you because of your disobedience and sins toward God. But now God, that same God is going to take everything, allow everything to be taken from them, lets them know that I remember what you were. And I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to restore this stuff back because the the penalty would have been paid. The price would have been paid. The debt would have been paid as relates to uh, what you have done wrong and what you have brought upon yourself because of that. So it's, you got that comfort. Okay? Now, the second segment uh, in this chapter is a more specific poem, and it's to the redeemed warrior tribe, or rather the entire family of Israel. Verses 14, 15, and 16, it reads like this. Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you people of Israel. I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I turned you into a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them and make the hills like chaff. You will winnow them and the wind will carry them away and the storm will scatter them. But you will rejoice in the Lord. You will boast in the Holy One of Israel. Now listen, again, while God is reminding them uh, what their deserved consequences have made them, because he opens with, you worm, Jacob, okay? He let them know, now you, you des you're deserving of this punishment that's coming upon you. But then God gives his word to buy them back, to redeem them, to make them strong again as it becomes important for them to remember who made it all possible. Because you see in, in, the, in the verse, in verse 14, he says, I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to buy you back, okay? But it becomes important for you to know who did it, okay? Who made it all possible for you. And that's in the second, more specific poem. But now, there's the third poem in the same chapter. And it's more of a general poem, uh, to the poor and the needy, or as I said earlier, those who have had everything taken from them. And it reads like this, verses 17 through 20. The poor and needy are seeking water, but there is none, and their tongues are parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As the God of Israel, I will not abandon them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. I will put the cedar in the wilderness, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive tree. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the elm tree and the cypress so that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this 
and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Listen, I don't know if you remember this, but it becomes important for us to understand when, when, when the Babylonians came in, as after the Assyrians had came in to take the children of Israel away, they destroyed everything in the land. They cut down trees. They burnt down forests. They just considerably just destroyed the land where there was nothing left. All of that land flowing with milk and honey, they devastated all of that. And it was just a wasteland. The whole area was just wasted. And, and God is letting them know, listen, it's important for you to understand the earth is the Lord's, but guess what? The people are the Lord's too, okay? God here gives this message of comfort to everyone and everything. You see, brothers and sisters, where sin and disobedience had opened the door to outsiders bringing extreme damage to the environment as well as to the people, God in his love, and he is saying in his promises that he is going to restore the environment and he's going to restore the people. The stuff that had been removed, he's going to replace. It becomes important for us to understand uh, how important that is when, when you look at, uh, you can imagine the devastation that those folk are going to experience when, when the hammer comes down on them because of their disobedience. And it's going to look like it's something that can never be restored. <clears throat> but remember, God can restore what looks like unrestorable. So now, having looked at these three poems, the message is for us in these three poems are these. First of all, God knows us in the innocence of our unsaved state of being, okay? <clears throat> God knew us when we were unsaved, not realizing uh, that we were on our way to hell, not realizing we didn't have a relationship with God, not realizing that we needed to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. He knows us in the innocence of our unsaved state. But then God also knows us in the excited obedience of our beginning salvation. You know, when we begin to realize how our worship and our way begins to come closer and closer, you know, when we first got saved, you know, and it was Jesus, all Jesus all the time, okay, and we were thinking about that and everything was just really up. Well, the, the, the people uh, in the text experienced those uh, feelings and, and things as well. And God is letting them know he sees that even in us, okay? Now, also, there's a third thing here. God knows us as our worship became routine and attending church has more to do with what we do instead of who we worship. Okay, it becomes important for us to understand that. Okay, God has seen all of these aspects of us in our relationship with him as well as in our relationship with each other. He's seen us when we didn't know him and we were innocent in that ignorance. He's seen us as we come to understand our worship of him, and we're excited about worshiping God. We're excited about reading our Bibles. We're excited about saying the word amen. We're excited about talking about the Lord to our family and friends. But he also knows us as our worship began to become routine to the point where we stop thinking about church as a place to come to worship God. We start thinking of it as a place where I have to do something, whatever that something is that we do, okay? And we spend so much time just in that doing of something that we forget about who we're supposed to be worshiping. But then it becomes important for us to also know that God knows us as we experience pain, loss, and loneliness. Some of which we brought on ourselves, while some are the attacks of Satan. Okay, it becomes important for us to understand that we experience these things. We experience pain, we experience loss, we experience loneliness, just to name a few. Now, true enough, some of those things we bring on ourselves, amen, but then there are some times when Satan attacks us and brings these pains upon us, brings these loneliness upon us, brings this loss upon us. And it becomes important for us to understand that. But now having said all of that, it's important for us to understand that God continues, brothers and sisters, to have a word of comfort, restoration, and victory. He has that for us in his time, okay, because he loves us unconditionally. Okay, I'm going to repeat that again. Because I think I'd like to hear that too. God continues to have a word of comfort, restoration, and victory for us. And he has it for us in his time because he loves us unconditionally. Amen. Now, something that I read a little earlier, and I want to kind of go back to it because it becomes an important piece, even though it kind of flows off the tongue kind of easily. And, you know, God describes himself as redeemer in uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. As a matter of fact, he says, Do not fear, you worm Jacob, you people of Israel. 
I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Now, that word Redeemer, even in the New American Standard Bible, as well as in the King James Version, is a standalone word translated into English. But the word actually is a hyphenated word that means kinsman redeemer. And it's important for us to understand that because that's a very important term as it relates to our relationship with God and our relationship with Christ Jesus. Okay? A kinsman redeemer, uh, also referred to as goel, pronounced goel uh, in Hebrew, is a male relative, a male relative who is culturally responsible to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or danger and needed to be redeemed or purchased from slavery or was in need of being rescued, okay? So now, in order to be a kinsman redeemer, because everyone couldn't be one, to be a kinsman redeemer, you first of all have to be related to the ones needing redemption. Secondly, you have to be willing to pay the redemption price. And third, you have to have the ability. You have to have the resources to pay the redemption price. So not only have, do you have to be related to the one needing to be redeemed, you had to be willing, you had to want to redeem them and pay the redemption price, but then you had to be able to come up with it. You had to be able to pay the price. So the kinsman redeemer became like a savior or a family protector for his next of kin. And so listen, check this out. God the Father, Yahweh, Jehovah, he was the kinsman redeemer for his chosen people Israel. Today we have Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, he became all of humanity's next of kin. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Amen. And this is, in case you didn't know it, you may have heard uh, some of the uh, uh, deacons praying back in the day, uh, people praying back in the day, and they would call Jesus our elder brother. You know, call Jesus our elder brother. Well, that's where the term elder brother referring to Jesus come from, not because we are equal to him like a brother, but because he's our kinsman redeemer. And because he's our kinsman redeemer, he's related to us. And because he's related to us, that makes him like a brother or an elder brother, which is the term that they used to use back in the day, which really means that because he's related to us, he not only fits the bill or the qualifications of being a kinsman redeemer because he's related to the ones being redeemed, needing to be redeemed. He's willing to do it. He paid the price. He willingly went to the cross and died. Okay, and he had the resources to pay the redemption price. In other words, his blood was sufficient for him to die. That was sufficient to pay the price for our redemption. Amen. So it becomes important for us to understand that. And so this becomes a great uh, launching point uh, in our study uh, of this section of comforting God's promises, remembering uh, what God has done for us, realizing that God remembers each phase of our lives uh, in our relationship with him <clears throat> and knowing that he loves us to the point where he will redeem, he's already redeemed us uh, from the damnation of our, the sin of damnation, but he also stands ready to restore us when we get off the track. Amen. So now, uh, having said that, I just want to say, share a couple of things with you uh, before I let you go on today. Uh, one of the things that I want you to do is, uh, I want to uh, I want to start uh, logging uh, our uh, prayer requests uh, and answered prayers. I know we have a number of uh, prayer requests that we have, uh, but what I'd like you all to do is, uh, if there's someone that you want us to pray for uh, before we close out today, I want you to just type their names in, and of course uh, we'll get those names and uh, we'll share those. Uh, but we want to also remember those. But if you want to. Type in shortly a uh, praise report, you know, something that God has done for you. Uh, that's important as well. Uh, for instance, uh, we want to remember uh, uh, Chairman Taylor uh, of our deacon ministry and pray for his strength. We want to remember our trustee chair, Sister Gloria Williams, and praying for her continued strength. We want to pray for uh, Mother Shirley Rule and her continued strength. We want to pray for Deacon Maurice Hawkins and his continued strength strength. We want to pray for the bereaved families. We've had some families who have had bereavement, and we want to pray for those families within our congregation that have had bereavement. We want to remember Sister Myla Kuntu, uh, and remember to pray for her uh, as well. Uh, if there's any other names that you all know of, just type them in, and uh, I'll get them, and I'll put them in the book, And because uh, I still have uh, our Wednesday prayer and praise report book, okay? 
and I still have that. And so, uh, but also, if you want to let me know about uh, some individuals or some things that have happened as it relates to a praise report, uh, type that in too. Uh, we'll get those. We'll put them in. And then uh, actually on next week, we'll read those. We'll share those in our sessions together, time together. And then we'll have prayer. Before we have prayer, I just want to also remind you that this coming Sunday <clears throat> is Communion Sunday. And we want you to know that for those of you uh, that cannot or will not be able to be with us uh, in the sanctuary, you can have someone come by or you can pick up commun Communion here at the church. We have it for you here. We'll be here from 10 until 4, uh, all the way through Saturday. So you can come by here and you can pick up uh, some communion uh, for your family. And of course, we look forward to worshiping together. We're following the COVID-19 protocols uh, here at the church, uh, but we will be having communion here at the church on this coming Sunday. I also want you to uh, remember our 76th church anniversary that's coming up. It's getting ready to come up October the 7th, the 8th, and the 10th. And we look forward uh, the sharing. October the 7th and 8th, service is going to be at 7 o'clock. It's our church anniversary revival. Uh, Dr. Darius Colvin, who has been preaching for us uh, through the years and our revivalist, he's going to be our preacher, and we look forward to hearing from him, from him. And then, of course, we're going to close it out in preaching on Sunday. We're going to culminate it with our own Pastor Meredith, Dr. Felker, preaching for us uh, on that day. Uh, the, uh, our general chairperson, Sister Corita, uh, Taylor and her committee has put together a nice very time of program celebration for us during that time and we look forward to celebrating our 76 years of doing ministry for the Lord here in this community and uh, we ask that you would continue those of you that can uh, come out and share with us uh, or log in uh, and look at us and share with us and of course be feel free uh, to support us through Givelify uh, if the Lord moves that upon your heart to do so so now, we've taken a look at that. I think I've covered just about everything uh, as relates to that. So now, we want to remember those names that are uh, on our prayer list for today, uh, names that I mentioned, names that you know of. We also want to celebrate our praise reports. I know one good praise report that I have is that uh, Deacon Maurice Hawkins is doing better. He's improving, and I received that on Sunday uh, from Sister Paula. And so we thank God for that. And, of course, there are many other praise reports that you guys know of and you feel free to share as we prepare to pray at this time. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see this day. We ask that you look on those names that we have submitted, that we are requesting that you give strength to, that you heal, that you protect, that you continue to restore in every way. And then, Master, we're thankful for the praise reports of those who you have restored, those who you have healed, those who you have strengthened, doing what we know you can do. Continue to be with us. Continue to bless us now. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to thank you for sharing with us on the day. I want to thank our camera person, Sister Jones. Sister Jones, say hello to everybody, please. Hello, everybody. And so uh, we look forward to the Lord saying the same, being with you on Saturday uh, for our church school lesson, and of course on Sunday at 11, via this same platform, the Lord say the same. Until then, take care, and God bless.